Welcome to part 3 of the Switched Mode Boost Converter video. In parts 1 and 2 we introduced the idea of the Switched Mode Boost Converter. In part 2 particularly uh, we started analyzing the circuit and we got to the point where we had uh, discovered what the current would do when the switch in the circuit was closed. At this point we will uh, figure out what will happen when we open the switch. And in order to do that, we'll tidy up a bit and then we will put our diode back in because when the switch is open, we'll discover that our diode is forward biased and so things change. So let's open up the switch. There you have it. The switch is now open. Okay. One last assumption that we need to make about uh, this whole analysis is that we are operating in steady state, which means that V out is not changing and that the current that starts at a value of zero uh, when the switch is first closed goes up to this value when the switch is then opened. In order for us to have a steady state operation, this current has to go back down to a value of zero at time t for the next time that the switch will close. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a steady state operation. This is important because this gives us the relationship between V out and V in. So let's look at this and see if we can actually make this happen. Uh, it turns out for this part of the analysis that our diode is forward biased. So instead of making it just go away and become an open circuit, it becomes a short circuit. And we now need to do the analysis um, with the diode looking like a short circuit. So the first thing we do is um, look at the voltage across the inductor, V out and V in, and we get the following relationship between them. We have V in is equal to V L plus V out. Okay, so the voltage from here to here is the same as the sum of the voltages across the inductor and across the output. That's a consequence of the fact that our diode now looks like a short circuit. We can solve this for VL and we get that VL is equal to V in minus V out. So the voltage, if we know the voltage across the inductor, we also know the rate at which the current through the inductor is going to change in the sense that that rate of change is VL over L, that's DIL DT, and since um, VL is VN, we can say this is VN minus V out over L. Okay, so this tells us that the inductor current is going to change with this constant slope. Now, um, in order for the inductor current to go from a positive value to zero, the slope has to be negative. It turns out the, the slope will obviously be negative if V out is larger than V in, which is why the uh, switched mode, uh, the boost converter, has a higher output voltage than input voltage. Okay, so the useful piece of information is that the slope of the current is given by this. Now we can use the fact that because we're operating in steady state, uh, the current goes from a, a value of Vn over LdT from this point up here down to zero in this time frame, which is T minus dT. Okay, so by um, by using this, we can actually then find a relationship between D, V out, and V in. We'll do this by first tidying up a bit. So the slope was V 
in minus v out over L. Okay, so if we start at a value of Vn, Vn over L dt, and then over a distance, a time distance, of t minus dt, uh, we have our uh, current going back to zero. We can write that as this relationship here. And we can now simplify this. We can factor a t out of this. And so we have a t here and a t here. Uh, since the opposite side over here is 0, we can divide both sides through by t, and these guys go away. We have this L and this L. We can multiply both sides by L, which makes these guys go away. Now let's see, why don't we rewrite this and see what we have left. We have Vn times D plus Vn minus Vn times D. I'm taking this and multiplying things out. Minus 1 minus D V out is equal to 0. Well, you can see that this guy and this guy cancel. We can do a little bit of rearranging, and we get then that V out is equal to V in over 1 minus D. Okay, so this gives us the relationship that we were trying to find between the output voltage, the input voltage, and the duty cycle of the pulse width modulated signal. From this, um, well, uh, well, actually, before we, we talk about average current, we need to do one more thing. You'll recall that we started off under the assumption that the inductor current started at zero and went back down to zero. This is a somewhat arbitrary assumption, but it turns out it doesn't change anything in our analysis if we do the following. So let's um, uh, let's just chop a whole chunk of this stuff out. Okay. Our analysis would look the same if we started the current at some arbitrary value and then it goes up with the slope Vn over L and goes back down to this same value. Okay, That doesn't change our analysis at all because our analysis of the uh, inductor current is, has been based only on slopes. And so we can change the starting point arbitrarily and our analysis still holds. Now you may ask yourself, well, why uh, would we want to do that? It turns out that um, the current, the inductor current, is related to the load current. And in order to get a particular power output, we need to be able to have our load current uh, times the output voltage be the power that we want to have. And so the idea that we can change our current up and down without actually changing the analysis is good. Now you may be asking yourselves, well, how in real life does this um, current actually change up and down? And that's the role, or, or that's the reason that we have the uh, uh, boost converter circuit in a control loop. The control loop will be monitoring the load voltage, and when the load voltage starts to sag, the control loop will change the um, uh, 
the duty cycle a little bit, and by changing the duty cycle a little bit, we'll actually be able to increase the inductor current. Um, so the idea is that this outside control loop is going to adjust the current to um, make it so that uh, our output voltage is related to our input voltage by this expression and the power that the circuit is delivering, that the converter is delivering, is the power required by our load. So um, that pretty much finishes the analysis. The one thing that I'd like to point out, which in fact I probably shouldn't have deleted my picture of the current, but I'll redraw a part of it like this. You'll notice that current is flowing this direction into the capacitor as necessary to keep it charged and into the load only when the switch is open. Okay, When the switch is closed, then the current flowing into the capacitor and into the load is zero. So the capacitor is actually seeing a current that looks something like this, well the capacitor plus the load. And this current is essentially zero, then it goes up to some value, um, goes back down to zero and so on. So uh, the good news is that the output voltage is higher than the input voltage. This is something that's very useful to be able to do. The bad news is that this current is discontinuous. It's off for half of or for part of the the pulse width modulated waveform and then on. And the fact that the current's turning off and on means that actually the voltage across the capacitor is not going to be exactly con constant, but it's going to change somewhat um, over every uh, every cycle of the pulse width modulated waveform. So the practical effect is that uh, the, this uh, power uh, supplier, power converter, will actually have some ripple at the output, which uh, either needs to be filtered out. Uh, sometimes, if you have, if you're doing per, uh, typically digital circuitry, some ripple at the output is not going to be a problem. But if you're trying to do uh, uh, analog circuitry that requires some precision in your supplies, then this ripple at the output will look like noise. So that pretty much um, completes the analysis of the um, of the switched mode DC to DC converter. I'll leave it as an exercise to the interested viewer, which at this point there may not be any, but if you're still hanging in there and you're still interested, to show that the average power provided by this source is the same as the average power that's provided to the combination of the capacitor and the load. Because, um, and the issue here is that if V out is larger than V in by a factor of 1 over 1 minus D, to have the same power, this power right here, or this current, I'm sorry, the current going to the load in the capacitor has to be smaller than this input than the average input current by the same factor. And it turns out that if you look at this carefully and look at the average currents, you'll discover that that is indeed the case. Well, my cell phone's ringing and you've uh, been through enough, so we'll quit. <laughs>